um, let me introduce um, our speakers. So it is a great pleasure to welcome you all at this first of the three Morse lectures of uh, spring 2021, uh, which will be held by uh, Nike Sun. The title of uh, her first lecture is uh, Statistical Physics of Random CSPs. And uh, well, let me remind you that there is a second and third lecture which will take place at the same time next Wednesday and next Friday. Uh, so now coming to our speaker, Nike is a renowned expert in probability theory and um, its applications to statistical physics and the theory of computing. After completing a bachelor and two masters at Harvard and Cambridge in mathematics and statistics, she received her PhD from Stanford University in 2014 under the supervision of Amir Dembo. She has held the SRAM Fellowship, a Simons Fellowship and a postdoctoral position at MIT and Berkeley. And in 2018, she joined the faculty of the mathematics department at, at MIT. She is recipient of the 2017 Rollo Davidson Prize, jointly with Gian Ding, of an NSF Career Award in 2019, and of the 2020 Wolfgang Dublin Prize. Uh, without further ado, let me leave her the floor to the first um, uh, lecture. And let me also ask everybody to mute uh, so that she can actually give the lecture without being um, disturbed. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, please, Nike. OK, um, uh, yeah, thanks very much for, for inviting me and for the introduction. Um, uh, so, so I will talk about uh, today the statistical physics of random CSPs. Um, uh, the lectures that uh, the first two lectures are, are based on joint works with uh, with these people, um, and uh, I know that there are uh, some some experts in the audience, but it's also a, a general audience. So please feel free to to stop me at any time with with questions or comments. Um, so I will start by describing some of the problems that we're interested in, um, and I have sort of a, a mixture of uh, these. Uh, typed slides and, and handwritten slides. So, uh, so it will be a, a mixture of that throughout the talk. Um, so the, the general outline of the three lectures, uh, uh, today I will introduce some of these uh, models of random CSPs. Um, and for the first two lectures, uh, I will mainly consider uh, a variant of the random KSAT model, which is a, a, a classical example of a random CSP. And um, the plan for today, and this will probably uh, potentially spill over a little bit into the next lecture, is that um, I'll talk about the, the non-rigorous solution for these models from the physics literature, um, uh, which was developed uh, starting from the, from the 70s and 80s. Uh, but uh, specifically for these models, they were solved in the, in the early 2000s. Um, and then uh, the next lecture, I will discuss the mathematical um, analysis of these models, um, which is inspired by the, phys the physics heuristics, which I will present today, but um, uh, differs greatly beyond the, beyond the basic setup. Um, and particularly, I will focus on applying the moment method uh, to, prove, uh, to prove rigorous results about random CSPs. Um, and finally, in the third lecture, I'm going to talk about a, a rather a different model, which is called the, the Ising perceptron, um, which is also a, a fairly classical model. Um, and it actually has some common features with random KSAT, which I will describe, but um, there are also uh, some interesting differences, which I hope to convince you of, um, primarily that it's uh, what is known as a, a mean field model. Um, in the sense that uh, the models I will talk about here are defined on our sparse graphs, but uh, this model is defined on a dense graph. Um, so I'll start uh, with introducing these models. Um, so a couple examples to keep in mind. Um, so say that you are given some large finite graph. Uh, so uh, there are vertices connected by, by edges. Um, there are all sorts of computational questions that you can ask about the graph. So uh, you can ask, um, uh, does it have a, a proper coloring involving at most four colors, where a proper means that no edge can be monochromatic? Um, so, uh, or you can ask, uh, does it have an independent set that contains at least four vertices? So uh, an independent set is a subset of the vertices. So it's marked here. Um, such that uh, no, no two elements in the subset are neighbors of one another. So clearly it's more difficult to find a larger independent set. 
Um, and both of these are examples of constraint satisfaction problems. So in the, in the coloring problem, the constraint is set on every edge. These two colors must not be equal. Um, here, the constraint in the independent set model is set on every edge. They must not both be occupied uh, by the independent set. Um, so this is on a, on a given graph G. Uh, and if you're given some large random graph, uh, then this defines a, a random CSP. So it's, uh, I generate for you some random graph according to any model that you like. And this gives you a random computational problem that you are asked to solve. Um, and then uh, these lectures are about uh, sharp threshold phenomena that arise in, in models of this type. So uh, here are some examples of that. Um, so these uh, sharp thresholds, they were originally conjectured, um, as I understand it, partly based on physics heuristics and also partly based on um, numerical experiments. So uh, first example is that uh, say that I take the Erdős-Rényi random graph. So this is the graph with n uh, vertices. And between uh, every pair of vertices, I put down an edge uh, independently at random with probability d over n. So uh, if I take this graph uh, and I fix a number q of colors, um, then uh, it will be q colorable with high probability. So meaning with probability close to one, um, if, uh, if d is small enough, smaller than some threshold. Um, and it will not be q colorable with high probability if uh, if d the average degree is larger than some threshold, um, and this is actually this one is actually still uh, an open problem, but it's a uh, fairly close to being resolved by by these papers. Um, another example is that uh, if I take the the random regular graph, so it's not so important that I take two different models here, but just to to say a different example. So this is a random graph again on n vertices. Um, where every uh, vertex in the graph has d edges outgoing from it. Um, so it's a regular graph, um, but then the, the connections among the edges are, are chosen at random. So in the random reg regular graph, uh, if you look at uh, a n, which is the size of the largest independent set, um, there, there may not be a unique one, there typically will not be, but the, the maximal size of any independent set, uh, normalized by the number of vertices, this converges to some uh, fixed constant, which will depend on the degree. Um, and this was this has been proved for for large d. Uh, and then finally, uh, uh, maybe one of the more well known examples is that if you take an oh sorry, go ahead. Is there a question? Oh, okay, may maybe not. Uh, so, uh, but uh, feel free to to interrupt if there is. Um, so, so finally, uh, if, uh, if this is an instance of uh, the random KSAT model, which I, I didn't define, but I will define something like that pretty soon, um, on n variables and uh, n alpha constraints, then it will be satisfiable with high probability if the, uh, the ratio of constraints to variables is smaller than some threshold and unsatisfiable with high probability if the same ratio is larger than some threshold. And this is known to be true for, for large K. So these are some examples of sharp threshold phenomena that, uh, that we're interested in and that I will try to describe in these lectures. Um, so a little bit about the, the history of the study of random CSPs. Um, they have been studied at least since the 1970s uh, in, uh, among different communities and, and also from different perspectives. So, uh, among computer scientists, uh, the questions are, they tend to be more along the lines of being about algorithm design and hardness um, in a non worst case setting. So uh, people were interested in, uh, can you go beyond, uh, beyond the study of worst case uh, instances? Um, so for example, can you take advantage of the, of the randomness in the problem to design a faster algorithm that will work on most random instances? Um, or um, can you prove something beyond uh, worst case intractability to say something stronger that maybe even in the average case, the problem is intractable? So these are the, the hardness type questions. Um, so I will mostly talk more about the, the physics and probability side of these questions. Uh, so from the physics point of view, uh, in the, around the 1970s, um, uh, 
uh, and, and before, uh, people studied uh, models of spin glasses, which are models of disordered magnets. Um, but they began to study them in, in mean field settings. And uh, in mean field settings, they found that they could um, get very precise predictions about the asymptotic behavior of such models. And then around the 2000s, they discovered that uh, the, the analytic methods that they developed for, for these disordered magnets um, could be adapted to study random CSPs, and they could give uh, very precise predictions about these models that are supported by numerical evidence. Um, and this theory is quite beautiful, and I will try to describe an extended example of that today. Um, it uh, unifies a lot of different models, but uh, the downside is that it is uh, not, not rigorous um, uh, as of yet. Um, and finally, uh, it's uh, interesting for probabilists because uh, random CSPs give natural models of systems that have long range dependencies. Um, and I will also say more about this in the talk, but just to, for an example to keep in mind, if we go back to the problem of um, can you give a proper coloring to a graph? So if the graph is a, is a tree, then um, it's, it's certainly colorable uh, by, by any number of colors, which is larger than one. Um, you can just start at any vertex and just work outwards from there and just never assign uh, the same two colors on an edge. So that's easy to do. Um, but on the other hand, if you consider the, the random uh, eight regular graph on n vertices, um, it's, it's easy to check that on the one hand, uh, locally, it looks like a tree. So if you, if you look at any, take any vertex and you walk out a few steps from there, uh, the, the neighborhood around a vertex for, for some distance, it will look like the eight regular tree. Um, but on the other hand, uh, it's, you can check by a sort of straightforward calculation that with high probability, this graph is not going to have a proper three coloring. Um, so it suggests that when uh, colorability fails, it's not because there's some uh, local uh, feature of the graph that prevents it, um, but there's some uh, global uh, geometry of the graph which is preventing the, preventing the graph from being colorable. Um, so this is why this is one reason why uh, such a model is interesting for for probabilists. Um, so me. in uh, sorry, can I ask just a simple question? Yeah, of course. For non-experts, what is CSP? Uh, a constraint satisfaction problem. Ah, thank you. Yeah, uh, I I just mean uh, I I guess I I just mean in the context of this talk, either the coloring problem or the independent set problem or the the satisfiability problem. Right. Thank you. Um, so what I will do is actually uh, introduce a, a very particular uh, example of, of these models, which is random KSAT. Uh, I, I will actually introduce a slight variant of this model. Um, and then I will try to uh, go through in some detail the physics uh, picture for this model and explain the, the viewpoint. Um, and then uh, in the next lecture, I will talk about the mathematical approach to this problem and, uh, and some open questions that uh, remain. Uh, okay, so, so let me describe the, the model that uh, I will focus on. Um, so uh, the more well-known model is random KSAT, but I want to choose a sort of simplification of the model, which is a little bit more tractable. Um, because for this model, I can describe uh, more, more concretely all of the, the phenomena that happens. Um, so this is a random uh, D regular K not all equal SAT model. So it has two parameters, K and D. And uh, we start by generating this large random graph, which will encode the problem instance. Um, so uh, in, uh, in contrast with before, where we just had a, a graph, I, I now have a, a bipartite graph where on top, uh, these, are the, these represent the constraints of the model. And then uh, on the bottom, these represent the, the variables, which I will get to choose. Uh, so uh, I will have uh, n variables. They will be binary. So each one will take the value plus or minus. And uh, each one has degree uh, d. So this has uh, d outgoing edges. Um, and then uh, on top, I have M uh, constraints, and each of them has degree K. So this one will have K outgoing uh, edges. 
um, so the the number of edges leaving the top has to agree with the number of edges leaving the the bottom, which means that uh, m times k has to equal n times d, which means that uh, uh, m divided by n has to equal d divided by k. So I would call this ratio alpha. Um, so uh, first, you you set up uh, this. Uh, this thing with uh, all of these half edges on the bottom and all of these half edges on the top. And then you just take a uniformly random matching from, from top to bottom. So you connect up the half edges uh, uniformly at random. And then once you have done that, uh, on every edge that you form, uh, you label it uh, either plus or minus. So once you're done, it looks something like this. Uh, and this uh, this whole thing here, this is the problem instance G. So G is a, is a bipartite graph with uh, uh, clauses on the top, uh, variables on the bottom, and uh, edges which are labeled plus and minus. Um, and then I have to tell you what, uh, what problem this encodes. Um, so it encodes the following problem. So this is a, a single clause or a, or a constraint. Um, and it has uh, k edges outgoing from it. Here, k is three. Uh, and here are the, the neighbors that it goes to. So I will call this uh, delta A. Um, and uh, the rule is that uh, this clause uh, will be violated if the assignment on these three variables is either equal to the assignment on the corresponding edges. So uh, here are the edges are plus, plus, minus. Uh, so the rule is that uh, uh, the clause is violated if the configuration on the variable is the same. So it's, it's equal to plus, plus, minus, like that. Uh, or it's a negation of that. So it's equal to minus, minus, plus. Um, uh, and this is the rule for, for this one clause. Uh, and then, uh, of course, you, you have a lot of clauses, and then the, the problem is that you must find a single assignment of the variables which satisfies all of the clauses. Um, so if you have a plus minus uh, assignment, uh, so for example here, I think you can take just all plus uh, is a valid assignment. So if you have some assignment of the variables which uh, does not violate any of these clauses, then this is called a solution of the, of the problem instance. Uh, so this is the, the computational problem that I will uh, discuss. Um, and then uh, one thing I, I want to emphasize is that this, uh, so I, I drew this picture because I, I got tired of drawing all the little boxes and I, I didn't have time to, to draw more, but um, the, the picture is, is very misleading because um, it shows, for example, all these short cycles, like uh, here there are two um, edges that go between the same uh, pair of nodes, um, it, it certainly can happen, uh, but in uh, when M and N are, are very large and D and K are fixed, it's very unlikely for this to happen. So, uh, so it's a sparse graph uh, in the sense that uh, every uh, every clause uh, has only K neighbors, every vertex has only D neighbors. K and D are are fixed bounded parameters, um, and M and N are going to infinity. So it's not likely to find short cycles in the graph because everything gets matched up at random. So when you match things up at random, it's not really likely that within a few steps, you will come back to the place where you started from. Uh, okay, so, um, so then for this, for this model or for, for, for this model as well as for, for other models, um, given the problem instance, uh, you can consider its solution space, which is a set of all plus minus variable assignments, which satisfy the constraints that are described by this graph G. Um, and then uh, the, the question that we would like to understand is uh, how does this solution space look like? Um, and then uh, it's, it's quite surprising and, and interesting, I think that uh, physicists conjecture that there would be um, sharp phase transitions in the in the structure of this space um, as alpha is gradually increasing. So, um, so this is just a picture which I, I will try to explain how this came about. Um, but in summary, what they predicted was that uh, when alpha is small, um, there are a lot of solutions because there are not a lot of constraints, um, and also the solutions are all kind of uh, 
they lie in a single cluster. So the picture here is that um, this, uh, this, um, this box here uh, is meant to represent the discrete cube. Um, it's a set of all possible assignments of the variables. And then uh, this blob in uh, black is meant to represent the set of solutions of your instance. And the fact that they're close to each other means that uh, you can, uh, two things are close to each other if you can get from one to another without having to flip too many of the n coordinates. So if you need to only flip one coordinate, then they're, they're neighbors in, the, in this uh, box. Um, so here, there, there are a lot of solutions and they're all, uh, they all kind of close to one another. You can easily move from one to another. Um, and then the prediction is that uh, once alpha gets past some threshold, uh, this is no longer the case, that uh, here you, you still have a lot of solutions, but they're, um, they lie in exponentially many uh, well-separated uh, components. So um, here is some clump of solutions and here's a different clump of solutions. And the prediction was that to get from here to here, you would have to flip a large number of bits to get from any solution here to any solution here. Uh, then uh, they predicted that as alpha gets even larger past uh, a condensation threshold, uh, you, you still have these uh, clumps of solutions that are well separated, um, but for some reason here you have exponentially many clumps of solutions and here you ha have only a bounded number of solutions. And finally, uh, at some point, the solutions will disappear entirely, so you're left with no solutions uh, at all. Um, and moreover, there was some uh, notion of universality in that uh, they predicted this picture for several different models. So they predicted this for, for coloring. Um, so for coloring, this would, instead of being plus minus to the n, the picture would be that uh, it would be the set of colors to, to the power n. Um, uh, they also predicted a similar picture for, for independent set. Um, but, but I'm going to mostly talk about the, the satisfiability models. Um, and I, I give this reference here as kind of the, uh, this is a, a very nice survey paper, which uh, describes uh, all, of this, um, all of these calculations and summarizes it in a, in a nice way. Um, so I, I probably will not talk so much about the unsatisfiable regime, but I will just mention uh, briefly. So uh, even when you go beyond the satisfiability threshold, um, you can still ask uh, questions about this model. And uh, this relates a little bit more to what um, computer scientists tend to be interested in. So, um, so in this regime, uh, uh, given uh, an instance, you can let uh, h of x be the, the number of constraints which are violated by x. And then you can consider the measure on, on all uh, x's, so on all elements of, of the cube, which puts the weight which is proportional to e to the minus beta times the number of constraints that are, are violated. So, uh, so h is, is a random function on, uh, on the set of assignments. Um, so this means that uh, this mu here, it's a, it's a random distribution on the, on the cube, which is determined by G. Um, and then as you send beta to be larger and larger, this measure, it will concentrate on whichever are the X's which have the minimal value of H. Um, so if you're in the satisfiable regime, then this measure, it will focus on the actual solutions of the problem. Um, but if you're in the unsatisfiable regime, then this measure, it will focus on uh, the, the max sat configurations, meaning the configurations X, which satisfy as many constraints as possible um, if there is no configuration that satisfies all of them. Um, and then you can ask similar questions. So you can ask, uh, what does the H landscape look like? Um, for example, if you just consider the, the minimal configurations, um, do they, uh, are they similar in geometry to what happens before the satisfiability threshold? So do they just lie in these kind of well-separated clumps or is there something more complicated that, uh, that is going on? Um, so the, the overall phase diagram of, of the model was predicted to be something like this. It's uh, fairly complicated. So uh, up to here is what I, what I already described. So um, this is the satisfiability threshold. 
Um, so you start with one big clump of solutions, uh, then a few of them sort of break off, but it's still mostly one big clump of solutions. Then you have uh, exponentially many well-separated clumps, then you have a bounded number of well-separated clumps. Um, here is beyond the satisfiability threshold. The prediction is that uh, you have um, a bounded number of well-separated clumps of minimal configurations. And then finally, that when alpha gets very large, so when you're far above the satisfiability threshold, there is some more complicated geometry, which is not well understood. Uh, so uh, for today, what I will mostly talk about is um, up to the satisfiability threshold. So I will try to describe uh, this, this picture here. Uh, okay, so let, let me just uh, very briefly say the, the model again. So um, so I will focus on this model of deregular random not all equal sat. Uh, so you have n variables, uh, m clauses, the number of edges is nd, which is mk, and alpha is a ratio of clauses to variables. Um, so you have a, a problem instance, which uh, looks like this. And then uh, your goal is to find an assignment of the, the variables, which satisfies every constraint. Um, and again, uh, a constraint is uh, satisfied. So clause A is satisfied um, if the assignment of uh, variables next to that clause. So here's clause A1, uh, and it has edges going to here V1, V2, and V3. Um, and then the rule is that the assignment of variables uh, the assignment of those variables, uh, it must uh, not be either uh, either equal to the assignment on the edges, so plus minus plus, uh, or the negation of that, so minus plus minus in this case. Uh, and again, a, a solution is a variable assignment which satisfies uh, every one of these clauses. Um, and we are going to study uh, S, which is the, the random a subset of solution. So it's a subset of the discrete cube. It's determined by this random graph. Um, and I will call uh, throughout, I will call uh, Z the, the total number of solutions. So the instance is satisfiable, uh, obviously, if and only if the, the solution set is non empty or the, the random variable Z is non zero. Um, also, in the satisfiable regime, uh, we would like to understand how does Z behave. So, for example, uh, does uh, 1 over n log the number of solutions converge to some uh, constant limit as n goes to infinity? Um, so uh, for, for the rest of this lecture, I'm going to describe um, the statistical physics approach. Uh, so there are two equivalent, uh, roughly equivalent approaches, uh, which are called replica method and cavity method. Um, uh, I plan to describe the, the cavity method um, although the, the replica method gives uh, equivalent predictions for, for this model. Um, and the, the general approach of the Kapni method is that um, uh, one way to say it is that the, you want to try to build a random sequence, uh, GN, um, such that, uh, first of all, each GN should be an actual sample from the model that you're interested in. So in our case, we want a sequence of GN such that uh, every GN is, a, is actually a sample of random deregular K not all equal sat. Um, and then the key point is that uh, GN plus one and GN differ in only a couple places. So um, there are not many differences from GN to GN plus one so that you might be able to compare one to the next. Um, and then uh, once you have produced the sequence, uh, you want to try to, to estimate uh, the total number of solutions on GN. And you will just try to do it by this uh, telescoping product. So uh, start with uh, G1 or maybe G10 or something. Um, and then you just consider this uh, product of ratios, Z of GI divided by Z of G I minus one. Um, and then uh, you want to try to show that this uh, concentrates around some, uh, some psi uh, at the exponential scale. 
So for example, uh, maybe if, uh, if at every step the change is kind of the same, uh, maybe you would be able to show that uh, each one of these uh, factors will concentrate near, near some fixed value for maybe for each I or for most of the I. Um, so alternatively, and this, uh, this also happens, um, it might be the case that uh, these factors have some, some randomness in this. So um, it may be that uh, each individual factor alone has too much randomness to concentrate on some constant value. So maybe the, the first factor will be like uh, one and the next factor will be two and the next factor will be 1.5. Um, but uh, over time, uh, you have a large number of factors and uh, you're sort of, there will be some averaging effects. So you might be able to argue that uh, if you take uh, one over N, sum over I, the log of, of this factor, it, it might still concentrate around some constant value. So this is the, the plan. Um, and then, uh, so I will try to explain how you, how you um, will guess the, the correct value uh, of this exponent. Um, and, and I will try to convince you that it's uh, complicated to, to get the correct value, um, even uh, if, you're, uh, if you want it uh, heuristically. And this is part of the challenge of, of correctly implementing the, the cavity method. Um, so this is, I, I think, part of the, the art of, uh, uh, that uh, statistical physics have um, uh, developed. Um, so the, the scheme of the cavity method will be that uh, I start with this graph uh, GN, um, and then I will make some uh, deletions from the graph. And then this will result in a graph with some stuff deleted. So this is why it's called the cavity graph. Uh, and then I take this cavity graph and I, I add some stuff back and then uh, I will get the, the new graph in the sequence. Um, so of course, the, the actual deletion and addition procedures, they will depend on the model that you actually want to, to study. Um, uh, so I will describe the procedure for, for our model. Um, and uh, as you will see, the, the steps that you make here, so the things you delete and the things you add, um, generally they have to be randomized and you have to take a little bit of care just to ensure that um, if you start with something which is a sample from the model, uh, this will also be a sample from the model. Uh, okay, so, so I'm going to describe the, the cavity method for, for this model. Um, and uh, in order to describe it, I'm going to assume that uh, alpha, which is the ratio between D and K is an integer. Um, it, it doesn't matter if it's not an integer, you can do a somewhat more complicated procedure, um, but the procedure in this case is sort of the, the simplest. Um, and the, the procedure will be the following. I start with uh, GN um, and uh, I will delete uh, this number of clauses at random to form a, a cavity graph. Um, then I will take uh, this graph and I will add a new variable. Uh, so this cavity graph has the same number of variables as uh, SGN, they both have N variables. So then I, I add a new variable and then I add uh, alpha K clauses, which are, which are new, and this will result in the, the new graph. So the picture is like the, the following. Um, so here, this is the original graph uh, GN, um, and I choose at random uh, some clauses to delete. So these are the clauses which will be deleted. Um, so I, I delete the clauses along with the edges that they go to. So now I'm left with this uh, cavity graph, um, G, uh, uh, this cavity graph. And um, uh, here I marked as U, uh, U are all of the, the variables which were neighboring to uh, one of the deleted clauses. And uh, again, I want to emphasize it's because I drew a very small example. So typically U will be a tiny subset of a really large graph. Um, unfortunately, in my picture, U is all of the variables, but usually it's a, it's a tiny fraction of the variables, of course. Um, then you add back. Uh, so these are the, the new uh, clauses that will be added. And this is the, the new variable and you connect things up again. Um, and uh, you give uh, random plus minus labels to the new edges that you have added back, and this will be the, the new sequence. Um, so here, uh, you, I, I'm using you to denote the, the variables that are next to the deleted clauses. So 
in the cavity graph, there are the variables which have degree one less than the rest of the variables. Um, and uh, this is the, the number of uh, elements of U. Um, so it will be again, uh, some bounded number of, uh, of elements. And in the original wow. graph, uh, the, the variables in U are the neighbors of the deleted clauses. And in the, the new graph, um, the, the variables in U, along with the new uh, variable n plus one, they will be the, the neighbors of the, the, edge, the clauses f prime that were added in. Um, so this procedure, uh, I, I claim it forms a sequence of graphs that have the desired properties. So uh, first of all, each GN is a sample from, from the model. Um, because I, I remove a, a random set of clauses and I, I add back um, I add back a clause which uh, joins things up at random. Um, and it's clear that uh, each next graph has only a few differences from the previous graph, so we might be able to estimate uh, what is the change that happens. Um, so so again, I, I wanted to draw it like uh, in this way because um, uh, just to, to show the concrete example, but, um, but again, it's it's a very misleading picture because, of course, U should not be should not be the entire set of variables. So, um, so I also tried to draw uh, how to visualize it for for large n. Um, so you can you can choose whichever picture you prefer. Um, so I, I usually prefer to visualize it like this. So uh, in G n, you choose um, two uh, clauses that you plan to delete. So the, this I will call uh, f prime. Uh, so once you delete those, you have uh, these variables u, which will have degree one less in the cavity graph. Um, and then you will add back a new variable and uh, these new clauses, and they will connect up uh, u into this, um, this tree of depth one. Um, and this is the, the final graph that you, that you end up with here. Uh, okay, so... Uh, now we'll try to calculate um, how the, the total number of solutions changes uh, under these steps. Uh, okay, so this is the this is the first step, which is that um, uh, I take these uh, these clauses f prime and I'm going to delete them, and I end up with uh, the, this u with um, with unmatched edges. Um, so I'm going to write. Uh, write x for, for an element of uh, plus minus to the n. And, uh, and again, these are, these are the u. So uh, I want to compare, um, uh, I want to compare the solutions on this graph, gn, with the solutions on, uh, on the cavity graph. So uh, note that uh, if I have an assignment x, it will be a solution on the graph gn uh, if and only if, first of all, it must be a solution on the cavity graph because the cavity graph has fewer constraints. So if it solves uh, GN, it must also solve the cavity graph. Um, so uh, in addition to that, uh, the F prime uh, constraints must be satisfied. Um, so this is an if and only if. Sorry, I erased that. Uh, so this is, a, uh, this is an if and only if. And this means that uh, I can write uh, this ratio in the following form. So uh, in the denominator, I have the, the number of solutions of the cavity graph. So I put it here in the denominator again. And in the, the numerator, I have the number of solutions of the graph GN. So I'm going to sum over X uh, indicator that it's a solution of the cavity graph. And then the extra thing is that um, the assignment of variables on U must satisfy uh, the new, the, the extra clauses F prime, which are in GN, but are not in the cavity graph. Um, and then I will write it uh, in this way. So uh, the point here is that uh, this, this quantity defines a measure on the cube. So I will call it a mu cavity, um, where this measure is just a uniform measure on all of the solutions of the cavity graph. Um, so so note that in this expression, uh, GN and the cavity graph are both completely fixed. So I'm not treating them at the moment as uh, random objects. I've just taken a fixed graph here and I've taken a fixed graph here. 
And the only randomness that uh, we are considering in this calculation is uh, what happens if I take a random element of the solution space of the cavity graph. So that's the, the randomness of, uh, of this measure here, but otherwise we treat everything as a deterministic object. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so then this ratio can be expressed as uh, if you take a random element from the solution space of the cavity graph, what is the chance that uh, that random element will have uh, will have uh, x sub u satisfying f prime? Um, so so far, actually, I didn't do anything that was uh, non-trivial. So these are just uh, these are just exact equalities. So nothing has has really happened. It's just a way of rewriting it. Um, and the the issue is that. Uh, of course, this uh, this measure mu is is not known to us because we don't understand uh, what the solution space of the cavity graph looks like, and maybe it's it's presumably pretty complicated. Um, so, in fact, uh, in the in the particular model that we are talking about, there is one thing that we do know, um, which is that if you look at a single individual variable v. Um, then we actually know that uh, under this cavity measure, it takes the plus minus values each with equal probability. And this is just because this particular model we're talking about happens to be symmetric. Um, so X is a solution according to the rules of the model, uh, if and only if minus X is a solution. So this means that the solution space is invariant under multiplying by, by minus one. Uh, so this this does imply that for an individual variable, we we understand that uh, it's it's equal probability to be plus or minus. Um, however, uh, for calculating this quantity, uh, u is not an individual variable; it's some collection of variables in the graph. And in order to know this, we we need to know what is the joint distribution of uh, of these variables. Um, so I will describe the, the first idea for, um, for how to deal with this, which is, uh, so as I, I mentioned a couple of times already, the, the random graph is locally tree-like. So the graph G has very few short cycles. Um, and this uh, in particular tells us that the variables in U, they're typically far apart when they're in the, in the cavity graph. And the reason for that is that uh, say that uh, this is one of the variables in U and this is another of the variables in U. So how, how was it, how did we find them? Uh, they arise because we chose some clause A in the original graph GN to be deleted. Um, and uh, U1 and U2 are the, the neighbors of A, for example. Um, but suppose that they are joined uh, in, uh, suppose that they are close to one another in the cavity graph, so that means that there is a short cycle that joins them. Um, well, this can't be because uh, uh, that means that when you look at the graph GN, uh, there's a, a short cycle, um, because this is a path which is not present in the cavity graph, so in order for them to be close in the cavity graph, there has to be a, a different path. Um, so because you typically don't have short cycles, uh, this cannot occur. So the, the vertices of the cavity, uh, the vertices of, uh, of U are, are typically far apart from one another. Um, so then if they're far from one another, um, a, a reasonable guess is that they behave roughly independently under the cavity measure. Um, this is like probably the, the first guess that we should make. Um, so in other words, that this measure has, uh, has correlation decay. So it's reasonable to expect that when variables are close to one another in the graph, they may be correlated because of the interactions among the clauses, but it's, it's also reasonable to hope that when they're, when they're far apart, so if you take a variable and you have to travel through many clauses to get to the other variable, it, it's reasonable to hope that they might behave roughly independently from one another. Um, so this, this is the replica symmetric assumption. Um, and it means that uh, when we look under the cavity measure, uh, so again, this is the, the uniform measure on solutions of the cavity graph, and we look at uh, the, the variables in U, um, how do they behave? Um, well, the, the replica symmetric assumption says, let's just assume that they behave independently to one another. So uh, that means that it's a, it's a product measure. And uh, 
each, each one behaves according to its marginal law uh, under, under this distribution. And its marginal law, we, we do know it's just half half, it's half plus, half minus. Uh, so this would imply that uh, it, it's roughly just the, the uniform measure on uh, all possible configurations on these U variables. Um, so, for example, in the, the first step of the cavity method, where we just remove uh, some of the clauses, um, this would give us a, a way to calculate this quantity because, uh, again, we, we take this ratio and we rewrote it as the chance that uh, when you take a solution from a random solution from the cavity graph, the chance that it satisfies the deleted clauses. Um, and under the replica symmetric assumption, it says, well, let's just assume that it's a uniform half-half uh, and everything is independent. So now it's a chance that just a, a uniform half-half uh, 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 plus-minus solution will satisfy uh, these, uh, these clauses. And I claim that this is given by, by this quantity. Um, and this is just because uh, uh, you have, um, so this is the, the number of clauses which were deleted. Um, each clause we treat as, uh, the clauses are, are separate from one another, so we take them independently. And uh, for, each, for each of these clauses, um, it doesn't matter what the edge assignments were. So suppose that the edge assignments were plus, plus, minus, um, it doesn't matter. Uh, so it, it joins to uh, these variables, which uh, say u1, u2, and uh, u3. And uh, on these variables, there are uh, two to the k, uh, two to the k possible assignments. Um, of which two are uh, invalid. Uh, so this is the two over two to the k. Um, so this gives uh, some, you know, it gives an ex exact expression. Uh, modulo this uh, this approximation, which is uh, maybe a little fishy. Um, and then the the second step, it's it's done in a very similar way. Um, so you take the cavity graph and then you add um, you add back these uh, new clauses to form this uh, depth one tree. Um, so uh, as before, we have this uh, plus minus uh, spin of uh, of length n, and then uh, x n plus one is the the spin on this new uh, variable that was just added. Um, and the, the neighbors of the new clauses, so these are the new clauses and the neighbors are uh, u as well as the new variable. Um, then the, the ratio of the, the number of solutions on the, the new graph versus the cavity graph. Um, similarly, you can write it in terms of the cavity measure, but you should sum over this new spin as well. Um, and again, uh, we take this uh, replica symmetric approximation where we say, let's um, just assume that these variables behave like independent, uh, uh, independent uh, random variables and each one is uh, equal probability plus or minus. Um, so then uh, by the same reasoning, you get uh, the same factor one minus two over two to the K raised to the number of new clauses and then the factor two just comes from the sum over the, the spin on the new variable. Uh, so altogether, if, if we combine uh, these things, then this cavity method uh, together with this uh, replica symmetric assumption, it gives that uh, starting from the graph on n nodes, moving to the graph on uh, n plus one uh, nodes, um, we can write it in this way. So divide each of the terms by the, the cavity uh, number of solutions. And uh, from step one, we had uh, this term. And then from step two, we had this term. And we can simplify it to simply this um, because uh, here we deleted this number of clauses and we added back this number of clauses and the difference is alpha. Uh, so this, this quantity here is the, is the so-called replica symmetric free energy. So if we make this assumption, then we come to the conclusion that, uh, we, that we know the number of solutions uh, in, the, in the model um, and the number of solutions, it should be this uh, explicit quantity. So this is, um, uh, again, this is two times one minus two over two to the K, so two to the N and this to the, n times alpha.
uh, so it's a it's a very simple calculation. Um, it gives this very explicit answer, so we're happy with that. And surprisingly, it's it's correct for quite a large regime of values of alpha. So it's correct for for the replica symmetric regime, um, uh, which goes up to a particular value uh, alpha condensation. Um, and the the reason that we find the model interesting is that. Uh, this alpha condensation, it's strictly before the satisfiability threshold of the model. Um, so this, this very naive approximation, it is true for a very large regime of alpha. However, it turns out that uh, a little bit before the satisfiability threshold, this is no longer, um, this is no longer correct. So in particular, this, uh, this approximation is no longer true. Um, so this will be the, the subject of the of the next lecture, um, but I, I will give some uh, preview of that. Uh, so what happens when you when you get above this uh, alpha condensation? Uh, so first of all, uh, with high probability, the number of solutions is much smaller than what the prediction that we got from this naive replica symmetric approximation. Um, and when I say smaller, I mean that uh, it's it's smaller on the exponential scale. So it will be smaller by a factor e to the minus n times some constant. Um, uh, and uh, corresponding to that, um, this this approximation is certainly no longer true. So uh, when you when you remove the the variables, er, when you remove the the clauses to form the cavity graph, and you look at the variables u that are next to what you removed. Um, it's no longer uh, will resemble uh, a product measure. Um, so another way of saying that is that uh, this is the point where, where long range correlations arise. Um, so uh, what, is, what is I think uh, amazing is that uh, in this regime, um, physicists proposed uh, a way to resolve this issue. Um, and they proposed a way to, to describe this measure, even though it's, it's now in this complicated setting where it's no longer um, just a, a simple product measure. Um, and they suggested that it can be explained uh, by a sort of a, what they call a one-step replica symmetry breaking structure, um, which is, it's not the, the product measure, but the idea is that it's, it's not too much more complicated than a product measure. And uh, the idea is that uh, you look at the, the solution space of the cavity graph. And uh, the idea is that uh, you would argue that it decomposes into some number of components, uh, which is large, but uh, bounded in some way. Um, and these components correspond to, they correspond to solution clusters. So they correspond to uh, clumps of solutions, which are close to one another in the configuration space. So that, that's called a schema. Um, uh, such that, uh, and this is the important point that uh, if you look within each uh, individual component, so if you take the measure, but you, oh, sorry, if you take the, the measure and you condition it on being within an individual uh, clump of uh, solutions, um, that that measure will uh, have correlation decay. So you, you lost uh, correlation decay in the measure overall, but um, by uh, decomposing it into components, you can recover it um, in some way. So another way of saying it is that uh, with this decomposition, the conditional measure is replica symmetric. Um, so, uh, and th this is the, the picture to have in mind that uh, you have some, some bounded number of, uh, of clumps of solutions and you're looking within, uh, within an individual uh, clump. Um, so then, uh, you have a modified calculation. So I, I still want to calculate this ratio. Um, and now the way I will do it is that uh, first I, I take this decomposition um, into um, these uh, different uh, components. And then I, I should look at the measure conditional on being within that individual component. And uh, within that component, the hope is that the structure is, is simple in some way. So hopefully within that component, I, I recover a product type structure. Um, so uh, unfortunately, it's still somewhat complicated. So in particular, I, I didn't explain how to get this distribution. And I also didn't explain how to derive uh, these, uh, how to derive these measures within, within the component. Um, and th this will be what I will do next time. Um, but then 
uh, if you are able to get uh, these quantities and, and you have a similar expression for the second step of the cavity method where you add that new variable, um, then uh, it's reasonable with, with all of these things that you can, you can get back uh, some formula for the number of solutions. Um, it will be a more complicated formula because you have this thing and, and this thing, which are more complicated, but it, it's not, the idea is that it's not vastly more complicated. Um, and uh, this different quantity here, it's what's known as the, the one RSB free energy, um, because uh, one RSB meaning that you have uh, this, uh, you, you take this one step of decomposing into clusters before you, um, before you do a product measure approximation. Um, and uh, in, in the regime that we're talking about, it is strictly smaller than the, the replica symmetric free energy. Um, and it turns out to be the, the correct one. So, so it is true that the, the log number of solutions concentrates around this value, um, not, not this value. And the, the satisfiability threshold of the model uh, is also given by, by the point where this uh, function crosses zero. Um, so, so next time I will explain, uh, uh, so next time what I will do is I will explain actually how to derive this value. Um, and then I will describe sort of the, the proof approach for, uh, for, for proving some of these, uh, some of these results. And I think, I think I'm out of time. So, so I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you for the beautiful lectures. Questions? Is, is there a, an, an easy way of going from, the, from this uh, not all equal uh, case dot to coloring or something which is close to coloring or uh, a, way, a way of seeing that this is actually the same problem more or less? Uh, I, I think that there's not a, there's not a formal way to go from one to the other. The, the mm -hmm. method of the physics method is certainly very much the same. Um, uh, in the, the proofs, um, I think the reason that it's more difficult to do for coloring is just that it's a, it's a higher dimensional problem beca because you have a larger number of colors to consider. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't know, I, I think it hasn't, people have not figured out how to go beyond the, mm -hmm. the binary problems. You said the things are universal at the beginning, what do you mean by that? Usually universality happens at criticality. Is mm -hmm. it just the four stages? Is that yes, I, I just mean that the, the four stages uh, occur in, in a variety of problems. I, I didn't mean it in the sense of universal critical excellence. Mm -hmm. About the connection to coloring, uh, I think the question was maybe about a hypergraph to coloring. And that looks uh, pretty similar to not all equal SAT. Ah, uh, yes. Um, so hyper, hypergraph to coloring is predicted to have, I think, exactly the same threshold as, as not all equal SAT, especially if you take the same uh, random regular bipartite graph. Right. Uh, and um, I think in general, there is an open question of, um, uh, not all equal set is like hypergraph coloring plus these uh, random plus minus labels that I introduced on the edge that makes it easier. But I, I think it's it's still an open question in general. If you introduce this random label to make your model easier, does it still give exactly the same results? I think in the physics, uh, the equations will just turn out exactly the same, but I don't think that there's a proof of this fact. Um, is, is it known if the free energy is a smooth function of alpha? Uh, it's, it's not. Um, actually, it has a, a non-analytic point at, uh, at uh, mm -hmm. so it's uh, analytic uh, up to here, and then uh, this is a non-analytic point. Is um, it, this is does, known. Does, does it jump or anything? I mean, does it have a, a jump in the derivative or anything like that? Or? Like uh, the non point. Is that known? I think it should be known in principle, but actually I don't know the answer okay. to that question. 
Yeah, well, I was mm -hmm. asking, wondering the same thing, whether it was a first order or a second. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, um, I should know the answer to that. I can check and let you know. Uh, I imagine it's first order, but I don't know. Yeah. I, I believe it's a, it's a first order transition, mm -hmm. yeah. So, I, I, you know, in, in spin glass theory, uh, mm -hmm. there's a work of Panchenko that, that uses these uh, Ethernetti type ideas, exchangeable processes and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. Does that enter your work too, or could it enter in a, in a similar way? Um, so I think that there, I think that there are places where we could have used some of that technology. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the main complication with the, in the graph setting is that, um, uh, is that the, the geometry of the graph is also involved. So I think that makes it more, more complicated typically than the, the mean field setting. Mm -hmm. So I, I think in the, in the mean field setting, it's sort of like uh, every variable has kind of a similar environment or there's more, there's more averaging in, in that way. Um, so, um, I think that there, there are places where we can take advantage of that. We, we haven't done that in, in the mm -hmm. proofs, but I, I think it's, it's possible to take advantage of that in some places. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any more questions? Well, that does not seem to be the case. So thank you very much for the beautiful lecture. And I uh, very much hope to see uh, everybody in the next installment, which is on uh, Wednesday again at 3 p.m. Thank you, Nike. Thanks very much.